A case like this is so prominent and so disturbing. We think about the idea if Mr. Kohlberger was hunting uh, one, one of these people, all four of them. We don't. I don't know that we really know everything in that regard. But so I could see that there would be logical factors that would make the prosecutor seek the death penalty. True crime enthusiasts, welcome to Break the Case. I'm your host, I'm Jen Coffendaffer, and I'm so excited about this episode. Joining me will be Kirk Nurmi. Now, for those of you who are true crime enthusiasts, you may recognize that name. He represented Jody Arias and actually saved her life, if you will, from getting the death penalty related to the murder that she committed against her boyfriend. We are going to be discussing two cases that are highly uh, talked about in the news right now. The first, Brian Koberger, who's accused of killing four Idaho students. And we're also going to be discussing Chad Daybell, accused of killing his wife and the children of his second wife. Now, these are obviously two cases that are death penalty cases. So what better person to join us than Kirk Nurmi, who has all this experience uh, litigating a death penalty case and a high profile one at that. So without further ado, Kirk Nurmi. Kirk, so excited to have you here to discuss the death penalty and some of the most important cases that are coming up right around the corner. Well, I should say one is around the corner and one is probably a couple of years away. But again, Kirk, welcome. Uh, thank you, Jennifer. for great to be here with you. And uh, I look forward to talking about the death penalty. I couldn't have thought of a better person to interview on this subject since you did represent uh, Jody Arias and she was not given the death penalty. But the first case I'd love to talk to you about is the Idaho 4 case, Brian Koberger case. I'm quickly going to go through the facts of that case. Essentially, there were four students, including Maddie Mogan, Kaylee Gonzalez, Zana Kernodal, and Ethan Chapin, who were murdered on November 13th, uh, back in 2022. And this was so, so very tragic. Uh, because they were Idaho students, they were getting ready to move on with the rest of their lives and just begin uh, their time in the real world. And I think for all of us, when uh, lives are taken at such a young age, it is really, really difficult. Uh, after a long investigation, I, I shouldn't call it long because in terms of what they were working with, which was somebody that was a stranger, uh, again, this is the prosecution premise, uh, that this individual, uh, it's very difficult whenever it's a stranger, somebody unknown or loosely known to the victims. And so their investigation, why, while it seemed to take forever, almost six weeks, it was actually done pretty quickly. And the big um, point, uh, the big turning point in the case was, of course, when the knife sheath was analyzed, DNA was found on it, and it was determined that that DNA could be no one else's on the planet to the octillionth uh, uh, decimal uh, that it was Brian Koberger's. He was charged and has been in a Lataw County jail uh, ever since he was arrested at the very end of 2022. Kirk, bring us through from the point he was charged, the decision that was made to go forward with the death penalty, what were your thoughts when you saw that? Well, you know, one, you know, there's there's a lot of thoughts. Look, I, I, I'm, I, I'm forthcoming in the sense that I don't believe in the death penalty. I've always been alert to that. There's lots of reasons for that. And we can get into that as, as that comes forward. 
But also as someone who practiced criminal defense for a long time, I don't always, you know, accept the word of the government point blank in terms of what happened and what what they believe. So that's initially you have to take some, I think, you know, we have a premise of innocent to proven guilty. And I think we all need to take that with a lot of cases. Um, but on a personal level, I think it did hit me. I, you know, I went to school. I got my master's degree at Washington State University. Um, I'm very familiar with that area. I spent about a year and a half there. The uh, University of Idaho campus is about, say, 10 miles away from Washington State University. And there is, you know, a lot of uh, cohesion between the schools. I used to do research at their law library, what have you. So um, I know about the relative tranquility of that area. It is what you would call a college town or two uh, neighboring college towns, right? And there is that tranquility and that sense of safety. And, you know, most importantly, one of the things, like I said, on a personal level is that uh, I know how much that would affect a small community like Moscow and, and Pullman, Washington as well, especially, like I say, with the good relationship between those universities and the students. Well, let me ask you this, getting back to something you initially said, and that is you are not a proponent of the death penalty. Can you give me your sort of top three reasons why? Sure. I I think it begins with the uh, first, I guess, the moral premise that killing is wrong. That is an imperative that doesn't change its shape or form based on whether or not it's a person doing it on their own or the government doing it, we the people doing it, if you will. Uh, The second reason is that the government sometimes gets it wrong. We've seen several people uh, exonerated from death row after years, dozens of years on death row, obviously showing that the process is not without its flaw. And of course, there have been executions that are later shown Uh, to be on a questionable basis in terms of the actual guilt or not. And the third reason is I think that uh, it is really actually a more severe punishment to put somebody in prison for life than it is to execute that person. I mean, you think most people would think if they had the choice between spending the next 20, 30, the rest of their life in prison or, or, or leaving this planet, most people would choose to leave the planet. So um, I think those are really kind of encapsulate, at least in a broad stroke, the, the reasons why I stand against the death penalty. Yeah, I've been definitely conflicted on the death penalty uh, really since college. In college, I chose to write one of my main papers in a class on the death penalty, and I went in 100% supportive of the death penalty. Uh, and when I finished... Uh, the paper, my conclusion said I wasn't for the death penalty, but it was solely based on pragmatic reasons. Just the fact that the appeals process, the money process, uh, and then also the concern regarding whether uh, the individual would have their case somehow overturned. That was always very concerning to me. Yeah, I mean, what what you said kind of prompted a response when you talk about the money and things of that nature. I also think about the magnification of of pain. I mean, having been a death penalty attorney for many years, one of the things that I think a death sentence brings is a magnification of pain because of the uh, impact that has on the offender's family who are uh, completely innocent in in the situation. A lot of people might say, well, you know, that's that's of their own doing. But in a way, it's not. And I think life sentence without parole kind of um, allows everyone to move on from the case without increasing the level of pain that that, that comes from all of it. I, you, it's such a good point, Kirk, because it's like pulling a scab off all of these uh, cases that as they linger on in the court system and the hearings and the new notifications about where everything's at, I think it has to be so difficult for the victim families, to your point. 
Well, yeah, the victims' families and 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 to to the offenders' families as well. I mean, no matter what we think about what the offender did, I mean, it's somebody's son or daughter. Kirk, let me ask you about when it comes to the death penalty and in the case like the Idaho Four, where at least two of the families, and I believe it's three now. uh, No, I'm sorry, it's two of the families. Uh, One family has not made a stance exactly. I mean, they basically said, we don't want anything to do with the litigation. We've moved on. We're healing the Chapin family. Uh, uh, the mother, Kara Kernodal of, of Zana Kernodal, has said she's against the death penalty. And the Mogans, as well as the Gonsalveses, are pro the death penalty. What do you think? Do you think that they should have any input? Do you think their input should be considered when it comes to the death penalty, Kirk? You know, ultimately, the prosecutor has to make the decision because it takes a lot of resources on the end on behalf of the government, whatever prosecuting body is to put towards the death penalty case. And they have to assess the likelihood that the death penalty will be imposed. But certainly the the families should have the input. Right. I mean, a lot of states have victim bill of rights that that make that input mandatory, what have you. But it's obviously can sometimes conflict with what the case, what the state thinks is proper for the case. And as you pointed out in your question, what different families might feel about it. So while it's the consideration, it obviously cannot be the factor, the the decisive factor. Well, I think it's interesting in this case, Kirk, because the prosecutor really is not pro-death penalty, at least in judging from prior cases and his record. So I thought it was interesting. I was definitely not sure which way he would go. Were you surprised that he put the death penalty on the table? No, a case like this is so prominent and so disturbing. We think about the idea if Mr. Kohlberger was stalking and hunting uh, one, one of these people, all four of them, we don't, I don't know that we really know everything in that regard. But so I could see that there would be logical factors that would make the prosecutor seek the death penalty because if Mr. Kohlberger acted in this kind of manner, and, and one of the names that first came to my mind when I first started hearing about this case is, is Ted Bundy. And if we have a man who is in that type of situation, you could see what would motivate, or that kind of mindset, I should say, you can see what would motivate a prosecutor to seek death. Right. I've had some interesting discussions with a lot of different uh, criminal psychologists regarding this, whether it was really a mass murder or whether it was a fledgling serial killing. And certainly the needle if, again, we're to believe it's Koberger that committed these crimes, and judging from the information we have from the probable cause affidavit and that's been released, uh, it certainly gives a lot of uh, pause in terms of this was likely a serial killing and the other individuals died as the result of being there more than being targeted per se. Yeah, I mean, you know, it, one of the things that the one of the big limitations of psychology always is that it cannot be definitive. We don't know. Only really Brian Kohlberger knows what his intentions were, what his plans were with one or, or all four of his of his victims. But yeah, I mean, those kind of factors too. When you talk about that, that psychological background, that profile things that that we're not going to know about because only the defense attorneys are going to know about those things also play a big role in this either decision to to seek the death penalty or the decision of whether or not jurors ultimately decide to grant to impose the death penalty when it comes to as you said the jury's decision and deliberation on the death penalty what do you look for as a defense attorney in terms of for Dyer from the very beginning, knowing you have a death penalty case? Is there a special grouping or questions that you ask that kind of help understand who might send someone to death and who might not? Well, ultimately, you know, I think one of the things just to give some context to it is that the most prominent thing you hear when you're selecting jurors 
in a death penalty case is how different it is when it's real life, right? If someone's listening to us, this podcast, and maybe they're talking to their friends about it, they're at a coffee shop, they're talking, it's a different dynamic to it than when they're in the courtroom. And that always shakes people. They say, oh, you know, I've had these opinions about it, but now it's different because they're looking at a person and then maybe they see their family member or what have you, and they're being asked whether or not they can impose the death penalty on that person. And ultimately to be legally qualified as a death penalty juror, and this this ultimately gets to your question, is that somebody has to be capable of seeing the worst of the worst, the most heinous murder they can imagine, and deciding that that person could also get life or death, that that decision would be open. So everybody's, you know, and and really ultimately, you know, a lot of jurors, studies show that jurors have PTSD after being a part of a death penalty case because of what they see and the decision they have to make. But that ultimate vor dire question that, that you reference is, could you give life to the worst of the worst? Could you give death to the worst of the worst? That is the legal standard. And so there's not anything in particular I think you could say that you're looking for, but somebody has to meet that standard. And that can be a real tough standard to meet for a lot of people. I mean, it's such a huge decision. And I think, too, when you're in a jury and you have a case like this, they are going to see the mutilation of four young kids. And I think that is going, in my opinion, if they decide that Brian Koberger committed this crime, the jury decides that. If they do, I think those pictures and, of course, uh, the victim statements and so forth, I think all of that is the reason why, if he's convicted, I can see this leaning toward uh, a jury deciding the death penalty. What are your thoughts on that? Well, I think if it does get there, I do think that the jury will impose death. But one thing I would uh, remind you of when you think about these cases, invite you to consider is that you and I as, as, as professionals in this business, we've seen different things, right? But no matter what, no matter what the case is that somebody's charged with the death penalty or even a murder case, that is going to be the most horrific thing most jurors see in their life, right? Whether it's one person or four people, regardless of the manner of killing, even if it's what we might consider less gruesome, right? Us us hardened professionals might consider less gruesome. It is still going to be the most horrific to that juror. And that's why we see the PTSD. That's why we see strain in the decision. That's why we see a lot of people realizing that they are just not capable of making that ultimate decision. Let me turn your attention really quick uh, to something you and I discussed offline. And that was the fact that Florida recently passed the law that said if you committed uh, rape against a child, that you would then be considered for the death penalty, which is, of course, actually against Supreme Court rulings. Uh, Now there's a case in point happening and uh, that's already beginning litigation. And another case, the Madeline Soto case, that is, you know, at the forefront of media right now that I could see moving into that realm was 60 counts. And she was as young as eight years old when the rape began. And there's video evidence. Uh, But what do you think from your legal perspective and background, do you think Florida will ever be able to send somebody uh, to death for sexual assault of a child that did not die? Boy, you know, that that is really reading the tea leaves. But I'll tell you, one of the most difficult aspects of being, and more particularly even a, a defense attorney in this situation, is you... Do, are required not to just litigate based on the current state of the law, but anticipated changes in the law, and which is exactly what we're talking about here, right? We have Supreme Court precedent that says you cannot get give the death penalty for any other offense other than first degree murder, and so Florida has obviously challenged that with this statute, and maybe 
uh, the Madeline Soto will be the first victim's case to, to go up before the court. And certainly, you know, bad, there are certainly horrific facts there, right? And we have different people. We see different people sitting on the court. So we see that that can lead to different outcomes. A lot of precedent maybe doesn't hold the same weight. So could I see Florida being successful? Certainly under this under this configuration of the court, I could definitely see that. Interesting. I, I think that that uh, really incites at least the public more than any other crime, perhaps. Uh, and that's why I think Florida moved to put that on the books, that law on the books. Um, certainly taking another life, especially as you pointed out, there's so many different manners that uh, you know, a gunshot wound maybe will seem less horrific than someone being bludgeoned to death or knifed to death. Um, but nevertheless, uh, the taking of a life. But I think people really grapple with a young child being raped. It's just so horrific. Well, well, there's there's no doubt about that. There is absolutely no doubt about it. I agree with you. Um, I, I still think, you know, life in prison is the appropriate response. The 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 problem or well, not the problem. The legal issue is that what the Supreme Court has consistently said is that unless it is reserved for first degree murder, that constitutes cruel and unusual punishment. And one of the ways that I like to share that with people or let people look at that is the idea we have a justice system, not a vengeance system. And that's kind of what the Eighth Amendment really stands for. So I certainly share the repulsion to the actions and and what have you and feel feel that anger as well. But, you know, right now the Supreme Court says it is limited to first degree murder, whether that will change because of people's anger, and that is kind of what the Eighth Amendment is supposed to protect against, if you will. But I do think Florida will be successful. It's such a great point you point out because, you know, whenever we're discussing these cases, it is difficult sometimes to pull back the personal emotion or personal, uh, you know, the revolting uh, of sensation you get when you have to look at these pictures and you have to go to these crime scenes and you see what occurred. And uh, I, I find it interesting uh, that, of course, juries now are stepping into the shoes of those investigators. And as you mentioned earlier, seeing for the first time something they likely had never seen before and never will see again. And then to have to make the decision as to whether they will impose Killing that person, as you first said, does it make it right for the government to kill really based on, in some ways, maybe the emotion of that juror rather than being emotionless and really looking at the justification? Did that crime result in death or did it not? But I'm glad you uh, brought us to what you think will happen. I can't wait to see how it how it does play out in Florida. Yeah, I mean, you know, case law evolves and the Supreme Court changes and and things change. And, and, you know, obviously, before Furman versus Georgia so many years ago, the death penalty was off the books as being violative of, of of the Eighth Amendment. And now we're seeing potentially the expansion of it the question becomes too and just as a matter of principle how how far does that go i mean we could decide some state could decide that they're going to do that for armed robbery that they're going to do that for kidnapping and how far will the supreme court allow that to go under the eighth amendment right that the, and of course that's the big concern i think of anyone is once you open that gate to allowing other crimes that didn't result in death at what point does that stop? In other words, how about somebody that had their limbs, you know, their arms cut off but lived or that that, that suffered blindness, deafness and, and, you know, are a fraction of the human that you were um, and consider themselves like they're dead? Uh, you know, at what point do you stop? So I, I do see the point it could become a slippery slope. Let me ask you about the fact that in the Brian Koberger case in Idaho, they recently moved from 
lethal injection to allowing uh, de death shooting squads, if you will, where a death squad will actually shoot at the heart of the individual. No one knows who does the shot because there's blanks in the other weapons and only one weapon has a live round. Do you think it matters when it comes to the death penalty? Would it help you as an attorney to argue it if you put on the table, listen, lethal injection, you just, you know, put them out or being shot? Do you think it matters? Uh, yeah, I, I mean, it ha it has mattered legally. Now, I mean, if you're asking on a personal level, maybe not, depending. I mean, as long as there's not torture involved, my opinion would be that maybe that it doesn't matter. But legally, it has mattered. I mean, that is why we why every state that had the death penalty, and I believe it's probably about 50-50 now or 25-25 on, on how many states have the death penalty. You know, it's a, it's a waning uh, system. But a lot of people, you know, there's been a lot of litigation, I should say. A lot of people's cases have been kicked out in terms of the death sentence based on the manner of execution. I mean, we've seen this with uh, years ago when there was a lack of the execution drug and the uh, American Medical Association was saying that doctors should not assist, things of that nature. So um, ultimately, that does become an issue because, again, it's like how – how if you want to consider shooting barbaric, which uh, th that that uh, firing squad barbaric, how far are we going to go down that road? Right. And that's that's another question on the Eighth Amendment. Like, you know, we're not going to have public hangings, et cetera. We used to. Right. So um, th those are the issues that get litigated in that technical aspect of the Eighth Amendment. Well, I think it's so interesting when you look at why are states moving away from lethal injection? And it is, as you said, phlebotomists, doctors, nurses, they're not the ones putting the needle in. It's the executioner that is. And they have trouble finding the veins. The uh, execution doesn't take place properly. There was one just in the news very recently. And this is a very, it just happens. It's difficult to find the vein and to have it work. And I think that's why you're seeing other methods. And when it comes to the firing squad, Kirk, as you may know, uh, that is a huge probability of success without suffering, if you will. You know, the shot goes straight to the heart and the individual immediately, immediately dies. And uh, you don't have issues with executions not occurring because of a technical difficulty. No, and, and, and I, I, I don't dispute what you're saying. I'm sure in, in the past there have been those issues, um, which is probably why it was deemed you know, off the top of my head, because that kind of that kind of law is is kind of in the in the history books, if you will, because everybody went to uh, lethal injection. But certainly, I think there were arguments made against that as being violative of of cruel and unusual punishment. Getting back to the Brian Koberger case, uh, I want to ask you about, and I know you've given your opinion that if he were convicted, that you could see them also deciding on the death penalty. How many years would Brian Koberger be sitting on death row likely if he were convicted and given the death penalty? Well, like, like every legal mind, I'm going to say it depends. Um, if you recall, uh, you know, Timothy McVeigh, the Oklahoma City bomber, he waived all his appeals and uh, execution uh, went fairly fast. Um, but on average, I believe it's about 15 years from the imposition of sentence to the actual execution for um, federal appeals to be exhausted. So, I mean, they look at everything. I mean, one of the, uh, another one of the burdens of being a death penalty defense lawyer is that everything you do is gonna be looked at at every level if a death sentence is imposed all the way up to the United States Supreme Court. Um, so they'll be looking at flaws and about 50% last study I know of about 50% of death sentences are overturned because of either judicial error or ineffective assistance of counsel. 
And of that percentage, Kirk, how many are retried or reconsidered? Or I think what you're saying is it doesn't affect the trial. It just means they're going to jail for life, like what happened in Scott Peterson's case. Yes. I mean, ultimately, if there's a finding of guilt um, that it does not fit in with that same 50% ratio, what we're talking about is the uh, imposition of sentence. So what will happen um, is the, for example, years ago, it used to be that in a lot of states, the judges decided whether or not uh, death could be imposed or not. It was solely a judge's decision. Well, the Supreme Court said, no, a jury has to make that decision. So what ended up happening is a lot of cases for which the death sentence was imposed had to be, the sentence had to be retried in front of a jury, not the guilt phase. So ultimately, those guilt phase uh, issues will have to be relitigated in about 50% of the cases. Wow. Do you know the percentage that they result in another finding for the death penalty or they result in life in I prison? I have no idea because a, a lot of what, what, I mean, you mentioned Scott Peterson and that's an example. Uh, the, the state itself may just say, okay, we're, we're just going to settle with life because we don't have maybe the witnesses are gone maybe we don't execute people anymore maybe there's a moratorium on the death penalty so i i think that's really kind of that's something if if there's been a study on it i'm i'm not aware of it because there's so many other factors that go into the consideration to even re try, try to resentence a person you know when you bring this up it takes me to uh the charles manson murders, uh, particularly the fact that uh, the death penalty was imposed. And as you said, uh, the state of California stopped uh, carrying through with the death penalty. So those individuals received life sentence. But the particular person that um, that it's always really bothered me is Leslie Van Houten. Leslie Van Houten, who you may know, was recently released uh, after receiving the death penalty, after receiving a lifelong sentence for the brutal murder of the LaBiancas, who were stabbed uh, up to 40 times, whose blood was on the wall, who were just massacred innocently by this group. And so... I think that the concern always is, especially in the case, just let's say that Brian Koberger is convicted or really no matter who is convicted of the Idaho crime, if he gets the death penalty and then somehow that is reversed and then somehow years down the line, uh, you know, somehow uh, he receives uh, a commuted sentence like Leslie Van Houten did. I mean, no one would have thought in their right mind that when the Manson murders took place that any of these individuals would ever be able to, uh, you know, have a cup of coffee in their living room, get married again, uh, you know, see relatives, enjoy a life. And look at where we're at. And I think that's why so many people do support the death penalty. What are your yeah, thoughts? Yeah, I mean, that, that specific issue is one that jurors are told uh, not to consider, you know, what the ramifications of a life term might be. But, uh, you know, I, I certainly, whether they completely dismiss those, that, that or not, I don't know. But I, I share those concerns. And, you know, I, I, even though I don't believe in the death penalty, I'm a big believer in life without parole. I figure uh, my assumption is that any conviction of first degree murder should be a uh, mandatory life sentence, no parole, no early release, none of that, just simply. And, and you know, it was said maybe half jokingly uh, when I was on court TV a while back with our friend Vinnie Politon saying, hey, there should be a life row. And there really should be where people are uh, you know, segregated and they serve their life terms and they go out until they die of natural causes. And that's it. Yeah, I, I can see this point of view, but let me ask you this. Those people still get to read books. Many of them get married. It, it's always amazing to me how many women want to marry men on death row. And I say this uh, 
knowing that actually an FBI agent who was in charge of the Huntsville uh, State, um, Texas State uh, Correction Facility, when I say in charge of, she was in charge of uh, the liaison between the FBI and that facility. She herself fell in love with somebody. And uh, uh, obviously she ended up not being an FBI agent anymore. But my point is it's when that person is allowed to live, they're also allowed to have somewhat of a fulfilled life. Awesome. I, I I I see your point, but I think that's the exception, not the rule. And I and I go back to what I said earlier. I mean, if if you were faced with that decision, the next twenty, thirty years in prison or or checking out now, most people would say they would check out now, right? And so again, I do think that's the exception, not the rule. I don't think I think it's it's. It's it's not really appropriate to say, hey, these people are living living life, you know, to the fullest. I mean, I certainly I think that a crackdown on those sort of things. I don't care about people that are on life row having jobs or or visitation or or, or any of that stuff. I I want them their existence to be as burdensome as possible, uh, but at the same time, you know, that execution to me is just a step too far. Fair enough. Let's move on to Chad Daybell because he his uh, trial is right around the corner. For those uh, listeners who are not familiar with the Chad Daybell case, essentially he was married to a woman for about 19 years named Tammy Daybell. And he began an affair, uh, by all accounts, with a lady named Lori Vallow. And it was in and around uh, religion, if you will. That was what originally brought them together. They were at a religious conference, and they grew to uh, apparently fall in love and then begin to conspire to kill their spouses and to kill uh, their children. Uh, so in any event, right now, that is what Chad Daybill is accused of, killing his former wife, uh, killing his or killing her two children, which are uh, JJ and Tylee. So bring us through in this case. What I have seen is a lot of issues in terms of the lawyer wanting to get off the case. Is this something that could be a reversible error in some way if he is convicted and if he is sentenced I to death? I think there is a lot about the case in terms of that sentencing phase, going back to, you know, that being the key ingredient, if you will, that 50 percent uh, uh, overturn rate. I sense just from the outside looking in that it is unlikely that any death sentence imposed upon Chad Daybell will be upheld if he chooses to appeal. I say that for several reasons. So Arizona, and I've, I've only practiced in Arizona. I'm, I think it's similar in Idaho, but uh, but Idaho seems to do a lot of things a little differently. The American Bar Association has guidelines that most states have codified in their law that says if someone is charged with a capital offense, they have to have two attorneys. They have to have a lead counsel and, and, and co-counsel. They have to have a mitigation specialist to help with that sentencing phase, someone who's trained in psychology, social science, what have you, to put that mitigation forward, and an investigator. Now, I know that uh, Mr. Pryor, his attorney, uh, does not have co-counsel. There's been some discussion about it, but he doesn't have it. The other thing is a lot of people say, well, he's death penalty qualified. He just hasn't done the things necessary. If he hasn't tried a death penalty case in the past under the guidelines of the American Bar Association, he is not qualified to be lead counsel on a death penalty case. So therefore, I would say that regardless of his lawyering abilities that are demonstrated at, at, during the sentencing phase, he is per se ineffective because he doesn't have that experience. He doesn't have the experience guiding a capital case and should not be there on his own. So I think right then and there, you have a good chance that any death sentence is going to be overturned. Wow. That Okay. Let me take a moment then and respond. 
and ask you why in the world then when he asked to get off the case, and I understand, uh, I just think the whole way he's handled things so far, and I'm arm armchair lawyering here, I suppose, but uh, it seemed like once the money was gone, he wanted to be gone, as opposed to really having some sense of, uh, you know, doing the right thing for his client. But that put aside, with what you've just said, why in the world didn't the judge let him off this case and make sure Chad Daybell has appropriate uh, representation? I don't know. It never made any sense to me whether Mr. Pryor uh, remained on the case and had co-counsel and what have you. Some of these other things that I just mentioned would certainly be a more more sustainable. I mean, ma meaning that the verdict would, the sentence would more likely to be upheld. I don't know why Judge Boyce is making the decisions he made other than to move the case along at this point, if you will. But I don't understand. And, and again, it's a different state, obviously, but it's completely foreign to my experience that somebody would be at the helm of a death penalty case and not be qualified to do so, even if the client is begging for that person to be on, especially without without a second chair, what have you. So it doesn't make a lot of sense to me. Uh, I, I don't know, like, you know, why Mr. Pryor, honestly, uh, I would take some issue with the idea that, you know, because the death penalty case takes over somebody's practice, the idea that he is doing this for free uh, seems to be out of the ordinary. Most people are there to defend the Constitution, not their client. I'm sure he doesn't. I, I don't. A lot of people presume that because a defense attorney is there representing a person that they believe in their client's innocence. And that is more often than not, not true. Yeah, what a great point. And that's the reason why I always say it's so important that competent defense attorneys are representing these clients. Again, it's not about emotion. It's not about feelings. It's about representation of the Constitution. And that person deserves rigorous representation. So it, once we lose sight of that, we've lost sight of everything. But I guess I was trying to make the point that it seemed, and my understanding is, uh, property was turned over uh, to Mr. Pryor. Uh, a great deal of money was turned over to Mr. Pryor for this representation. And it did seem that when seemingly the money ran out, that he was going to leave. I'm not trying to suggest, I guess, that somebody work for free, because that doesn't make a lot of sense. But rather that knowing from the onset uh, this was a death penalty case and what that would entail. And if you agreed to accept a case based on the amount of money you were given by your client, at what point is that immoral or wrong on the part of a defense attorney to then try to vacate? Well, I, I would agree with you as to that point. If he and Mr. Daybell made some sort of uh, agreement and, you know, typically it, it's Again, talking about foreign to my experience, most people don't hire private counsel when they're facing the death penalty. They can't afford it. It'd be millions of dollars, right? So because if you came to me years ago and said, I've got a death penalty case, you'd probably need two, three, four million dollars to get started, right? And so, you know, the idea that they had some sort of agreement like that, if Mr. Daybell upheld his end, uh, then he sh then obviously he's entitled to that representation because Mr. Pryor made the deal. But if it was done and Mr. Daybell, for example, did not pay his bill, the assets weren't there, then Mr. Pryor would certainly have a, have a point. But ultimately, that's between him and uh, Mr. Daybell and Mr. Pryor. And in a way, the judge, because the judge has not said you can get off the case. So the judge has spoken. I think we're definitely moving forward with Mr. Pryor. But huge concerns if indeed he's convicted and indeed the death penalty is imposed. As you said, this sounds like a, a pretty easy appeal. Well, and, and I might add to that as well when we talk about that 50 percent. One thing that we haven't talked about is... If you recall, a few weeks back, Mr. Pryor made a, 
I think, a well-taken motion to have the death penalty dismissed because Ms. Vallow did not get the death penalty. And the reason I say that's well taken is because under the current state of Supreme Court case law, equally situated co-defendants, it's been found unfair under the Fifth, the Fourteenth, and the Eighth Amendment to impose the death penalty on one and not the other. And as we know, Judge Boyce, as a punishment to the state, if you will, uh, dismissed the death penalty against Ms. Vallow. She can't get it. So now you're looking at potentially equally situated co-defendants. That's why I think that Mr. Daybell is going to throw not really Alex Cox under the bus, Lori's brother, so much as her, because when if if the number one job of a defense attorney is to, in this situation is to save a client's life, they will they will be working towards the end of saving that life and not maybe not at the trial level, but also at the appellate level. And by showing Ms. Vallow is equally culpable, that also diminishes the chances that Mr. Debo will ever be executed. Great point, but Kirk, let me ask this question. In one venue, meaning in Idaho, uh, Lori, the death penalty was taken off the case. As you well pointed out, they're very evenly positioned in terms of their culpability. But my understanding is in Arizona, they only charged her with conspiracy, and that's why the death penalty is off the case there. So since you're talking about two different venues, does what you say still uh, hold true? Uh, I Well, you're right about Arizona not imposing the death penalty on Ms. Vallow. Now, I am not, for, I would think the answer would be yes, but I don't know that that's been litigated because, as you might guess, it is rare for people to be uh, convicted of of murder in one state and then also another conspiracy, what have you. But ultimately, I think the way the case law stands now, it's really directed towards one state. And what what uh, Mr. Daybell and Ms. Vallow have done is certainly uh, d- disturbingly unique in terms of, of what they did. And I don't know off the top of my head if there's any case law that would account for different jurisdictions imposing death. Yeah, it's it's going to be interesting. I I mean, the whole case is so horrible. Uh, of course, I think what really bothered me the most about the case, it, it always bothers me when children and, and you know, young people are, are murdered. But what really bothered me was standing behind uh, this idea that this was all in the name of God or what God wanted or they were devils and, and they deserved to die and all this almost Damien Omen 2 or, you know, movie uh, uh, script that somehow they used God or something, you know, that's considered very good to hide behind, in my opinion, their actions. I always believed that they don't believe, but rather this was just an excuse to have an affair, uh, to try to get money, and to rid themselves of their responsibilities. What What are your thoughts, well, Kurt? Well, you might be right. I mean, I, uh, you know, there, I, you could, we could probably talk for hours about cults and the dynamics of cults and things of that nature, right? And you know, I've heard discussion on, on Court TV and other places of whether or not. Uh, you know, they really believed these things or not. Um, you know, to me, ultimately, Jennifer, the conclusion I get to, though, is that the motives don't matter to the victims. Their lives have been taken either way. And the the the, the veracity which where they believe these things, is ta- it, their life is taken either way. And and to me, I don't think that matters to them. And and I guess we in in that regard. I don't delve too deep into it, and I just look at it from that factual analysis that these two children and 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 Miss Miss Daybell um, have been murdered. Kirk, I love how you are so cerebral. I mean, I know just in our conversations we've had, and even the conversation today, that these cases bother you, but you are able to separate. Uh, that feeling and emotion uh, and do the job, do the legal job and look at the legal parameters. And I think that's what makes a 
defense attorney and a prosecuting attorney so good. And uh, so I tell you, your insights today, uh, to me, just amazing. Uh, is there any other death penalty case that you wanted to touch on or any other particular point regarding the death penalty that we didn't hit? No, no, there's really not. I think we hit a lot of them. But, but you know, I want to say something, and I appreciate your kind words uh, about about my perspective. But, you know, I think it's important because, you know, if you have people in law enforcement listening or prosecutors or what have you, you know, it's it's very tough and stressful work and there's a lot of unhappiness and it can really skew our view of humanity. Right. I mean, whether you're a defense attorney, prosecutor in law enforcement, you know, you can tend to see the worst of the worst. But one of the greatest parts about being out of it is and using happiness as a beacon is that I can really connect to the reality that I'm not going to let anybody else's lack of humanity rob me of my own. And I think that that's something that everyone who's in that business should try to connect to as often as they can, because we don't those in in that business don't want to lose their humanity and, and, and should not. It's just not a healthy way to live when we do that. It's so true. And when you look at cases where uh, police officers have been indicted and convicted of of excessive use of force against arrestees, I think you just named the crux of why it occurs. And that's because the day in and day out, everything you see in law enforcement, the worst of the worst that humanity can be and can act, and somehow that becomes sort of a Pulp Fiction normal, <laughs> where, yeah, all this is normalized, and then somehow that line that is really a red line between right and wrong gets blurred and gets gray, and, you know, we see people step over, and it's because the humanity issue, I think, slightly left them. Such a, such a great point uh, that you make. Uh, Kirk, I can't thank you enough. I know we had a few technical difficulties. I wish I was looking into your face and able to see your eyes as we discuss, but I can clearly hear in your voice, uh, you know, you explained so well everything. And, and I thank you, Kirk, and I look forward to uh, seeing you again on Court TV. Kirk, is there any other place you're going to be? anytime soon. And where can we find you on social media? Uh, well, first of all, thank you, Jennifer. I really appreciated uh, our conversation and, and always enjoy when we get to spend time on uh, Court TV together. Uh, people can find me on social media, on Twi on X. I keep still want to call it Twitter. On X, on yeah. Nermi Unchained, and same for Instagram. And um, if they want to know more about my books and what have you, uh, you can look me up on Amazon, Trapped with Miss Arius, and Defend Your Greatness, which is a book that really talks about my journey away from the law and towards happiness, and uh, which is, I think, is, is a real important book. It's my, my personal favorite anyway, but people can check all, the, all my books out Thank on you so much for joining us on the Idaho 4 Chad Daybell Death Penalty Discussion. Uh, wow, wasn't Kirk great? I mean, some of those thought-provoking... Uh, not only ideas, but just principles he had. I just thought he was really, really good. And um, I hope that you did as well. And if you did, please press the subscribe button and the like button and continue to follow us uh, on Break the Case with Jen Coffendaffer. Uh, we are working on some different formats and lives and, and different ideas and possibilities. So we have been a little changed up in our scheduling, uh, but we hope to get back on track and hopefully have recordings come out Sunday at noon. That's the idea in the future. Uh, the Friday afternoon uh, release uh, we thought might have been in the middle of everybody's day and it might make more sense uh, to do a Sunday afternoon release. In any event, 
Thanks again for joining us, and until next time, may justice be served.